We now move to the third dimension of our discussion, which is, uh, which is the novel. The beginnings of the Indian English novel lie with Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's Raj Mohan's wife. What does the year tell us? The year 1864 tells us that the novel as an art form grew quite early in India. This was followed by Raj Lakshmi Devi's The Hindu Wife, Toru Dutt's Bianca, and Tagore's Chokher Bali, later translated as Binodini. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's Anand Mat is very well known, as is Devi Chaudhrani. His novels deal with the theme of patriotism and there is always this message of love for the country, unity, strength, revolt, freedom, love for independence in whatever he writes. Here is his little picture. Rabindranath Tagore has a wider range in terms of theme and two important books I would like to mention here are Binodini which deals with the problem of women, especially Indian widows and his home and the world that later Satyajit Ray adapted as Ghare Bhaire in his film. The book deals with the relationship between the individual and society. Another book of Tagore's that is very famous is Gora. It again deals with problems of race, identity, belonging. It also gives us a view of Indian society before independence. Mulkraj Anand's The Sword and the Sickle, K. A. Abbas's Inkalab are also two important books belonging to the pre-independence era. These books naturally deal with problems of Indian politics, the freedom struggle. Some of these writers were also short story writers. Bhabani Bhattacharya's So Many Hungers, R.K. Narayan's Waiting for the Mahatma, Kamla Markandya's Some Inner Fury are three books that we can add to this list. They deal with the problems of Hindu-Muslim conflict, the Bengal famine, maybe the turbulent events that led finally to the partition of India. Two novels dealing with Gandhi's civil disobedience movement and the politics of the early 30s are K.S. Venkata Ramani's Kandan the Patriot and Raja Rao's Kanthapura. Kushwan Singh's Train to Pakistan, Bala Chandra Rajan's The Dark Dancer, Manohar Malgaonkar's A Bend in the Ganges deal with the theme of partition and the terrible violence that followed in its aftermath. The big three of the early Indian English novel are Mulkraj Anand, R.K. Narayan and Raja Rao. We begin with a short look, a short discussion on Mulkraj Anand. His important books are The Untouchable, Kuli, Two Leaves and a Bud, The Village, Across Black Waters. This slide gives us a little peep into his life and how he has been able to so wonderfully integrate 
the west with the east. He responded to the call for independence by writing about it. He developed communist leanings and most of his books deal with the problems of the common man, especially the untouchable which is one day in the life of Bakha, a poor untouchable who has to struggle to earn a little money for his family. Similarly, Kuli deals with the life of a simple porter and the difficulties and sufferings he undergoes. His novels are marked by powerful observation, delineation of character and realistic portrayal of life. Mulkraj Anand has been often compared to Charles Dickens, a similar kind of setting and theme prevails in Dickens's novels. The purpose is to highlight what is wrong in society and sometimes Mulkraj Anand also suggests solutions. The master of Malgudi, R. K. Narayan, his important books are Swami and Friends, Bachelor of Arts, The Dark Room, Waiting for the Mahatma, The Guide, My Dateless Diary. R. K. Narayan is a regional writer in the sense that most of his novels are set in a place called Malgudi, an imaginary town. But then it is not so imaginary. It is actually modeled on the place where Narayan grew up in Mysore and recreates the people lifestyle, joys and sorrows of characters he picked from society. Narayan probably knew most of the characters he created in his books, which is why they seem so likable, lovable, realistic, and one can easily identify with the kind of life he tries to depict in his novels. His characters are unforgettable. This is one of the features of his works. He has the ability to probe their minds. So Narayan is not actually so simple as he looks. Some of his novels, stories, books show deep insight into human nature. What is important about his books are, is his use of the English language, which is masterful, his use of irony, humor, satire. However, there is optimism, faith, hope in whatever he writes. Raja Rao is the third of the big three. His important works are Kanthapura, The Serpent and the Rope, The Cat and Shakespeare. Here we have a picture of the big three. Raja Rao's works are marked by an enchanting prose style being a product of the Gandhian era, we have a portrayal of the principles of Gandhi and the old Hindu tradition. Sometimes his novels cover events that go beyond India into foreign lands like England and France. With the big three, we move to a quick discussion on Indian-English women novelists. 
Today they are a class by themselves. Their contribution to Indian English writings as a whole cannot be underestimated. What uh, we need to understand here is that though women may have entered the literary field a little late, but when they did, they made a difference. There is some connection between the growth of feminism in India or what we could call the growth of the women's movement and contribution of Indian women to the Indian English novel. The women's movement in India has something to do with education. It was for a long time that there was no education for women and it is with women entering the freedom struggle and the efforts of reformers like Ram Mohan Roy, Mahatma Gandhi, Swami Dayanand, Swami Vivekanand, that education for women came to be available. With education came awareness and with awareness came self-expression. Women's writing in India, diverse and multilingual though it is, has tended towards a preoccupation with challenging the traditional roles assigned to women, the quest for an identity and the assertion of the self. I would like you to understand something here. It is not as if Mulkraj Anand, R.K. Narayan or Tagore were not writing about women. Many of their books, like we just talked about Vinodini, and many women play a major role in the stories of Narayan as well. But then women were never at the center. They were never the focal uh, center of the book or the story. Also, much of the portrayal of women in the novels of these early writers was somewhat typical. The woman depicted fell into a kind of slot. Either she was deified, she was like wonderful, perfect, a paragon of virtue, or she was totally evil. The need to probe a woman's psyche was not felt for a long time. And I think this happened only when women writers as such began to write. I do not also mean to suggest that male writers are incapable of probing the psychology of a woman. Male writers are as feminist as female writers. But the contribution of women writers when we talk about Indian English writings as a whole is something we need to talk about separately. And so, as this slide clarifies, the quest for an identity, the search for the self, becomes a central theme in novels written by Indian English women writers. The beginnings lie with Raj Lakshmi Devi's The Hindu Wife, Krupa by Satyanandan's Kamala, a story of Hindu life and Sagun, a story of native Christian life, Cornelia Sorabji's Love and Life Behind the Parda, which is a very funny portrayal of, you know, how Indian women lived in the Zanana, as it was called, the women's section of the house. And for once, the social taboos, the restrictions were satirized, the portrayal was sympathetic, realistic. Kamla Markandya is the first important contributor post-independence. Her important books are Nectar in a Sieve, Some in a Fury, A Silence of Desire, 
possession, a handful of rice, the coffer dams. Here we have a picture of the first three important women writers, just as we had Mulkraj Anand, Raja Rao and R.K. Narayan. Here we have Kamla Markandya, Ruth Pravar Jhabbala and Nayantara Sehgal. We will take a quick look at their works and features. These are the important features in the novels of Kamla Markandya. Her novels are essentially social, social in the sense that they talk about social issues. India in a state of transition is depicted in her books. She sometimes deals with the theme of East-West encounter. She touches on Indian politics and a major area of concern for her is the rural urban economics of India. The rural urban economics of India. Ruth Pravar Jhabwala is the second important contributor. Her books are To Whom She Will, The Nature of Passion, Esmond in India, The Householder, Get Ready for Battle, a backward place. Her books are marked by some influence of the West, mainly because of her own Polish dis descent. She is a Polish woman married to an Indian and so naturally in her we find this cultural conflict between the western tradition and the eastern value system. She depicts the woman's sensibility but her novels chiefly move around the depiction of Indian traditions, Indian customs and sometimes she satirizes them as well. Anita Desai is a path breaker. Her important books are Cry the Peacock, Voices in the Sea, Bye Bye Blackbird, Where Shall We Go This Summer, Fire on the Mountain and Clear Light of Day. Here we have a picture. She was shortlisted for the Booker Prize a number of times, but by some trick of fate, it is her daughter who won the prize and not she. So Kiran Desai was the winner of the last or the second last Booker Prize and she won it for her book, An Inheritance of Loss. Anita Desai I called a path breaker and I would like you to think of her as uh, following the first group of three. We could place Kamla Markandya, Jhabwala and Sehgal in one group actually. Sehgal though I will talk about her a little later belongs with this group because her novels too are largely set in a political background and so the socio-political setting is what is more important in the early novelists. Whereas with Desai comes a change and what is the change? The change is that we now move from the external to the internal. As we say here, depiction of the inner landscape. Suddenly now, the place where things happen is not outside, but inside the mind of the character. She sometimes makes use of the stream of consciousness technique. And we know what this is. 
The stream of consciousness is a modern technique in novel writing. It was popular during the modern period in England and Europe. And in this kind of uh, depiction, the thoughts of the character are the focal point of the novel. So, the novel actually does not deal with a traditional plot as such, there is no sequence of events and much of the novel grows out of the flow of thoughts in the form of an interior monologue in the mind of the character. Use of powerful language and imagery, marriage as a theme and the man woman relationship is of primary concern to this side. She sometimes makes use of symbols and other modern techniques as well. Sehgal as I just said I will talk about her a little later and here she is. Her important works are Storm in Chandigarh, A Time to be Happy, This Time of Morning, The Day in Shadow, A Situation in New Delhi. The titles are not exactly suggestive, but I would like you to keep in mind these few facts about Sehgal. She was the daughter of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. This need not be mentioned, but it is an important fact because it, it explains why she has such close knowledge of the political scenario and why politics forms the backdrop of her novels. Probably because she grew up in this environment and knew it well, she was able to depict it so realistically and convincingly in her books. Important events like the partition of India, the emergency and the Bengal famine find their way into her works. She has command over English. This is not hard to believe given the western education that she had and she depicts government bureaucracy and not always in a flattering way. Often her depiction is satirical because she was able to see what was wrong. With Sehgal, we actually have talked about four important early Indian English women writers and we have looked a little briefly no doubt but we have looked at their contribution as a whole and it has not been small, neither by way of the volume, the number of novels, nor by the way of the insight into human life, especially that of women, social and political background that their novels depict. Chaman Nahal is another major name, My True Faces, Azadi, for which he won the Sahitya Academy Award, Another Dawn, The English Queen, Queens, The Crown and The Loincloth are his important novels. Here we have his picture. His books are marked once again by similar features in the sense that he is also involved with the politics of the time, especially that of the 70s. In Azadi, he deals with the problem of partition and its aftermath. His books are marked by realistic portrayal of character and the problems of India. Salman Rushdie. In 1981, he published Midnight's Children, one of his most famous books. Midnight's Children is a complex story because 
it traces the events of India's history on the one hand and it also traces the birth and events of the life of Salim Sinai so that the events in the character's life move parallel with the events of the country of his birth. And so Salim Sinai is one of a number of Midnight's children born with a special destiny on the midnight of 15th of August 1947. So it is a wonderful book, very moving, very challenging, very intriguing and very symbolical. Rushdie has been a controversial writer, we all know that. And the controversy largely surrounded the satanic verses. If you remember the uproar that this book made in 1988 and the fact that it was banned and a execution notice was given to Rushdie. He lived in exile for a major part of his life. His important books other than Midnight's Children are Shame, The Satanic Verses, Haran and the Sea of Stories, The Moor's Last Sigh. He is a British Indian novelist and many critics like to call him postmodern. Postmodernism or postmodern is a slightly problematic term, but Rushdie can be called postmodern in that his books break almost every convention of language and style, and there is a kind of mixing, what we call the pastiche, the bringing together of a number of influences under one book. He is also said to use magic realism, you know, the ability to write something that is totally unbelievable and also the use of a number of modern techniques in novel writing. A dominant theme of his works is um, the East-West encounter and the conflicts that arise out of that. Other names that I can just mention and not go into are Raji Narasimhan, Bharati Mukherjee who is a diasporic writer settled in Canada, USA actually. She is writing, uh, living and writing in USA. She teaches uh, creative writing at Berkeley. But her novels are essentially Indian in theme. We have Mrinalini Sarabhai, Arun Joshi, Shashi Deshpande is a very Indian writer, very steeped in Indian life, Indian tradition. She lives in the south, in Bangalore, is a housewife. Her world is a small world limited. She does not write about east-west encounters and big events, but her works are extremely um, insightful, deep and give us a wonderful look into the Indian woman of today, caught between tradition and a sense of freedom. Dina Mehta, Nargis Dalal is a pa Parsi writer. So we find a very strong Parsi uh, influence in her books in that she talks about the dying traditions of the Parsi people. And we all know that they are a fast diminishing community, a cause of great concern to them. 
With this, we come to the end of our discussion on the novel as such, and we move to the flowering of Indian English poetry. We left poetry, if you remember, with the early poets. And if we need to close this discussion on Indian English writings, we must close it with a brief look at what has happened to poetry, drama, novel and prose now. The new poets is the, the name we would like to give to these younger poets of today. They are different. They are not writing on themes like myth, legend and history that we saw in the works of Toru and Arudat and the other early poets. If you look at the bottom of this slide, it mentions something like their works show modernist tendencies as well as consciousness of tradition. This modernist tendency is about the changing times. To this group belong Kamla Das, who is a distinctly feminist poet. And this note is what is missing in the works of the early poets. Some modern in Indian English poetry is in the confessional caste. Now, what does confessional mean? A kind of poetry in which the poet appears to be writing about her or his innermost thoughts, desires, problems. Powerful depiction of urbanization, India in transition, we find in the poems of Ezekiel. Ezekiel as in Nisim Ezekiel, other important poets we need to mention at least are Dom Moray's, Nisim Ezekiel as we just mentioned, Pilal, Kamla Das, A.K. Ramanujan is an important name. R. Parathasarathi also, Suniti Nam Joshi and Jayant Mahapatra. They have done a lot for English and Indian poetry, each in his or her own way. They are highly modern. They make use of modern stanza forms. There is an impact of the modern poets of the West on them, like maybe the imagists, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot. The last leg of this talk covers Indian English prose and for this we need to go back into the past slightly because we did not talk of prose really when we started with this discussion. Indian English prose uh, comes even before poetry. and. The areas that prose came in are translation, law, journalism, oratory and social reform. I think uh, this is very easy to understand. Given the kind of history India has had in the last 50 years, prose would inevitably be tied up with these aspects, journalism in particular and social reform. The pioneers were Ram Mohan Roy, Rana De, Vidya Sagar, Dwarka Nath Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore's father, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Vivekanan, Keshav Chandra Sen, and K.T. Telang. The extremists, as we know them, in the struggle for freedom, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandrapal, and Lala Lajpat Rai also contributed to English prose. Most of these people had a grounding in English and so they wrote, but they wrote with a purpose and that purpose was to awaken the masses, to generate political consciousness, women's liberation and to quicken or at least increase the pace of social reform. In their writings, we can see the growth of a nationalistic temper, 
and foundation of some important associations like the British Indian Association, the Indian Association and the Indian National Congress. I wonder if the freedom struggle would have taken the course it did without the writings of these great people and how they must have used their pen to first awaken and then act, then execute. The Indian English journalists in the pre-independence era are Sisir Ghosh, Surendranath Banerjee, Annie Besant, C. R. Das, K. M. Munshi, Lajpat Rai, M. K. Gandhi. Acharya Kriplani was the editor of The Vigil and through the writings of these writers, politics and journalism remained closely linked because they were not really writing for pleasure, they were writing with an objective. Three great prose writers are Radha Krishnan, our second president, Raghunathan and Nirad C. Chaudhary. Here we have a picture of these three early writers. We begin with Radha Krishnan and prose is the last that we are talking about. He was educated at Velour and Madras Christian College. He was a teacher of philosophy, a writer. He taught at Madras, Mysore, Calcutta and Oxford. He presided over the UNESCO General Conference. He was president of the Sahitya Academy. He delivered a number of lectures and addressed a number of meetings like the World Congress on Faiths. He was India's ambassador to Soviet Russia. He was vice president and finally the president. His important works include the philosophy of Rabindranath Tagore, the reign of religion in contemporary philosophy, the Hindu view of life, an idealist's view of life, Eastern religions and Western thought, religion in a changing world. From the titles, what one can make out is the range and how involved he is with the Hindu tradition, Hindu thought, but not without its relevance to Western ideology. And maybe in his works we find the need to integrate the two. His works show three important features. Number one, a close reading of the Vedantas and other Indian classical texts like the Upanishads and epics. It is said about Radha Krishna that his extempore speeches were a pleasure to hear. He spoke in brilliant English and his speeches were interspersed with innumerable quotations from the Hindu texts, especially the Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads and the Puranas. He was completely familiar with Western thought and he had a mastery over English. N. Raghunathan, his important works are The Coming of Freedom, Our New Rulers, The Avadi Socialists, Planners Paradise, Reason and Intuition in Indian Culture. He talks about politics, education, philosophy, literature in his works. 
He portrays Indian traditions and beliefs. His prose is eloquent and immersed in learning. Finally, we briefly mention Nirad C. Chaudhary, the grand old man of Indian writing. He has been rated as a top class writer in terms of theme and style. His magnum opus is Autobiography of an Unknown Indian. Very well known. One of the most telling books we have on Hindu tradition, life in Calcutta. He lived in London but wrote about the life in India that he knew so well. He is also a great satirist. He did not think twice before satirizing all the customs and traditions that he found were redundant and useless. That is exactly what we mean by fiercely honest and unsparing critic of men, morals and manners in contemporary India. Few Indians would have had the courage to write the way he did. In the autobiography, about the autobiography he has said, it is more of a national than a personal history. So the book is actually misleading. It is not really the autobiography of an unknown Indian. It is also the autobiography of India as a nation. As such, we get a very detailed analysis of the political and cultural life of India in the pre-independence era. I would like to come to the conclusion now. Having been through a quick look at the four major genres in Indian English writings, that is poetry, drama, novel and prose, what do we conclude? And where does Indian English writing stand today? Today Indian English writing stands at a place that fills us with hope in the sense that it is a voice that is heard the world over and two important events that prove this are Arundhati Roy and Kiran Desai winning the Man Booker Prize. We have a little quote here by B. B. Kachru that somewhat sums up what I am trying to say. In India, the English language has blended itself with the cultural and social complex of the country. It has become the language of the intellectual makeup of Indians. It is the only language, except perhaps Sanskrit, which has been retained and used by Indian intellectuals in spite of political pressures and regional language loyalty. In certain ways, the use of English as a link language and the growth of in Indian English writing has for the first time created a pan-India literature which symbolizes the cultural and socio-political aspirations of Indians. So what we have here is the importance of Indian English literature, no doubt, but also the importance of the English language to the average Indian. It is not just that India is a link language. It is also this that English is almost a sister language. It is one of the many languages. And like we write in our native languages, we write in English. 
as a mode of self expression, as a way of writing, then English is as significant, important as the other regional languages of India. To conclude, the growth of Indian English literature has been like from a sapling to a tree. What we have tried to see today in this brief talk has been a journey, a journey that Indian English literature made from when the British came to India with their language to now. And as such, it has been a journey of growth, a journey of betterment, a journey towards improvement. And there is, there is much more that is perhaps to come. With this, I would like to conclude this talk on Indian English writings. Uh, I hope it has been a little informative and it has given you a kind of bird's eye view into what Indian English writings has meant for us from the time that it started to now. Thank you very much.